much for this wonderful opportunity to be here. Satya and me, we have been interacting slightly over one year. Uh, we have started doing something towards relating education with innovation. But before I start, I will make just three quick points, uh, including what humble initiatives we are doing over the last four and a half years, or few, last few years there in Dibruga. First of all, I think many people in this hall are not quite aware of the location where we are situated. Uh, as he said, I am from Dibruger, Dibruger University, and this university is one of the 700 odd universities of the country, of which 299 universities are state universities. We are one of the state universities. Dibruger University is the easternmost university of the country. If I take a flight from Dibruger, I will reach Hong Kong, Singapore, Kuala Lumpur, Bangkok earlier than if I had taken a flight to Delhi, Chennai, Coimbatore, so on. This is one perspective. We are located in one of the 27 biodiversity hotspots identified worldwide by the uh, uh, United Nations organizations. So it's unique in terms of biodiversity, plant, animals, microbes, and also social diversity, ethnic diversity, tremendous. The hundreds of dialects in one state only. This is number two. Number three, that we are a 50 plus year old university. Now, coming to identifying or harnessing the enormous potential of the students, the creative potential, the innovative potential of the students. I do not believe as much as you would not that there is any difference in the inherent, innovative, creative potentials of students in terms of geography, race, language, caste, creed, and all. So from that point of view, I think it's a question of opportunity that you would have to offer to the students to take out their creativities, innovations, so on and so forth. To that extent, I would like to tell that vast majority of Indian universities, more so the state universities, uh, we operate in the realm of certain basic fundamental myths. One myth, I think it is true to most of the other universities and higher education institutes as well. That is, in the universities or higher education institutes, it is the professor, it is the faculties who are at the center point, who are the major stakeholders. It is the professor who decides what to teach, what to think, what to do. But we forget that the last stakeholders, the principal stakeholders in the university system are the youth. The students, they can be major stakeholders. They have a mind to think. They have, they have their own aspirations to learn. These are all limitations. These are all the myths with which we have to operate. Hardly in the university system, I, I'm not generalizing. I'm just, from my own experience, I am telling. If you go to the classroom and you start teaching, more often than not, the teacher would not love the questions to be asked. He will ask questions. She will ask questions. This is one point that needs to be completely eliminated if you want to harness the innovative potential of the students. You have to, we have to give space to the students. We have to make the minds open in the university. Second is our higher education system is too classroom centric. Somebody said we have to go, I think someone said just now, we have to take them to discussions, different spaces, field trips, studies and all that. We have to make them learn from the larger classroom of the world. Make them accountable. Make them observe the real life situation, identify the problems, ideate, come up with innovative ideas, and take it forward. 
So this is not happening. The semester system that we have brought in as a part of the academic reforms in the country is a fantastic. Nobody would question the importance of semester system. But what is and the shift from the annual system to the semester system in a country as vast and as diverse is not that easy. It is not just a mere system shift from annual system to the semester system. It, is a, it requires a culture shift. It's a tremendous culture shift. In a semester system, every hour of teaching has its credit, it has its value. In an Indian situation, you can imagine what can happen with so much of diversity, so much of festivity, so much of cultural, cultural practices, so many things. So it takes time to evolve. This is another point. In the name of continuous comprehensive evaluation, if there is in the department seven teachers, every day there will be seven examinations, traditional, conventional mode of examinations of assessments. This is ruining the whole system. The basic, the very essence of education is being robbed by this kind of system misshift or mismanagement. It will take time, I'm sure, I'm very optimistic. We have to do who are at the helm of affairs to see that these things happen the right way it should happen. But as I said, it's a matter of culture, more than a matter of system shift. Number two, uh, some initiatives, as you mentioned, we are located also in the middle of at least two Navaratra companies of the country. Oil India and ONGC Limited. We also have the Coal India. And Assam has 700 plus T states, organized sector, big companies. Largely owned earlier by the British companies, now gradually being shifted to Indian hands. When I joined three and a half years, four and a half years back, I realized, and I was aghast, 50 years, 50 kilometers where these companies' headquarters are located, nothing in the name of industry academy are interfacing. At most, once in a while, the university would approach the industries for a small little fund for organizing a seminar or a conference sponsorship, and that's the beginning and that's the end of the industry academia relationship. Now what has happened? There was an Oil India instituted chair professorship, KD Malavia, one of the few in the country. It has been now revived. It is taking off. Now we have taken off collaborations on, on the basis of simple four clauses doable, feasible, effective, in the form of memorandum of agreement with these companies, oil, or upstream, downstream, everything is there. BCPL is downstream, Oil India, Indian Oil Corporation, they're all located within 40, 50 kilometers of the country, uh, of the university. The four clauses, one, in our board of studies, in the Department of Petroleum Technology, Applied Geology, Petroleum Engineering, and others, Pharmaceutical Science, the Thea Study Center, and all that, a panel of technocrats will be member on the board of studies. They will help us, they will work yeah, shoulder to shoulder in framing the syllabi. Number two, there will be a panel of technocrats who will be forwarded by the companies, by the industries, to the department, to the university, who will be teaching every semester one chapter or two chapters. Third, our faculties and students will be regularly deputed to the industry so that the teachers who are engaged in grooming the students for the industry, they get the feel of what the industry is, first of all. Most of the university faculties do not have any idea as to what an university ecosystem is like. Aspiring minds, the recent survey said, only 3% of the engineering graduates are employable in the hardcore IT sector. That speaks about the value of education. Once we can pump in quality to the education, then we can think, and when we create the space for the students, for their independent thinking and all that, then I think uh, things will improve, innovation will come. There is a massive, massive pool of potential creators, innovators sitting in the backwaters in SM, 
and for that matter, in the entire country. I could have given you more examples, but I think time is a constraint. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.